one of you uh, thank you so much for taking your time out to be a part of this event where we're going to talk about transforming your azure environment using the azure cloud uh, adoption framework and uh, working with on the automation using terraform this session is mainly focused on helping you understand uh, how you can uh, take a complete journey from infrastructure as code to infrastructure as data. A bit about me, my name is Sumar and I work as a global cloud practice head here at my company called Royal Cyber. And along with me is Mohammed Hamza. Uh, he is our Azure cloud engineer. And together we'll be basically taking you through a journey on cloud uh, Azure's cloud adoption framework and how you can actually transform your infrastructure from using infrastructure as code to infrastructure as data and uh, and and hamza will be demonstrating that using a very 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 in-depth technical demo to cover that this is the agenda for the event so we're going to start off with introductions and from there we're going to talk about the journey through the history of infrastructure deployment then what is the need of infrastructure as code how does Azure Cloud Adoption Framework come into play? Then we're going to quickly move ahead into the demo. We're going to talk about our journey from IAC to IAD, that is infrastructure as code, to infrastructure as data. And from there, you know, we have an exciting offer for you, uh, especially the ones who are attending the, the, the webinar. And then we're going to quickly move into Q&A. Now, before I actually talk about the session itself, I just want to take two minutes to just help you guys understand about Royal Cyber. So we are a ID consulting and digital transformation company where we specialize in services, solutions, and software. Uh, we've been working in the tech industry for more than 20 years now, and we have more than 2000 plus employees working around the globe. Uh, we have 10 different offices situated in five different continents, and we have more than 600 customers working around the world. Uh, we are a award-winning company with different recognitions and we are also a ISO 27001 certified company as well. I, I'm from a, <coughs> uh, a business unit called Digital Transformation where we have five major practices that is cloud, middleware, enterprise modernization, DevOps and data and analytics. And uh, these are some of our clientele, our global clientele as a matter of fact. And these are they belong to certain verticals like healthcare, banking and finance, retail, emerging and manufacturing. These are sort of like our silver layer, silver lining medals that we proudly, you know, uh, showcase to the world that these are some of the famous companies and brands that we've worked to throughout the years. These are some of our business partners like AWS, Google Cloud, and we are a Microsoft Gold certified partners. We've been, we've been Microsoft Gold certified partners for more than 15 years now. And about along, the, along the line, we're also partners with other great companies like Dell, Cell, Salesforce, Automation Anywhere, Hybris, and, and so on and so forth. Now, so before I actually, you know, talk about uh, the actual problem, I want to talk about, uh, I, want to, I want to lay out some groundwork. So infrastructure is code, right? It's everywhere. It's everyone's talking about it. Everyone's trying to adopt it. It's like sort of like uh, the the industry trend right now. Whenever you want to deploy your infrastructure, whenever you want to move towards the cloud, or or you want to move towards on-prem as well, you want to have that satisfaction of automation that basic infrastructure code as code provides you. Hence, it's everywhere and has become a industry norm. But it wasn't always like that, right? So before that, you know, like times, things were a lot simpler and uh, they were a lot manual. As an example, let's take an, let's look, look, look at this uh, basic deployment pipeline. Here you can see, you know, a simple code push using GitHub, you know, pushed into a Jenkins server. Eventually, you know, it goes over to a Docker image and then from the Docker image, the image gets stored into a GCR bucket pulled into an artifact registry and then eventually, you know, deploys over to a GKE cluster. Simple, fair enough, straight to the point, gets the job done. What's the problem? The problem is trying to deploy this uh, for, your, for, your, for your environment. 
Now, normally what you would do in order for you to set up everything, set everything up, you would have to log into the console. You would have to individually uh, deploy these resources either by using the shell script or by navigating through the UI itself. But the point is that each and every step that you're going to take, it's going to be a manual step, each, uh, each individual item one at a time. And you're going to set this up, right? This gets complicated because as you move along to different environments, this gets challenging along the way because now you have to replicate this environment on different, uh, sorry, you replicate this infrastructure on different environments and you have to sort of like do a lot of copy pasting with a bit of tweaks and, you know, tweaks and threats uh, here and there, depending on the type of environment you're working on. Like for example, if you're trying to work on a dev environment, for Kubernetes, you might be running one node. For a staging environment, you might be running two nodes. But for a production environment, you will be running three nodes by default. So you're going to do a bit of changes on each environment depending on the uh, the likelihood of availability and the criticality of the environment. But yeah, nonetheless, it's going to be a lot of copy pasting throughout the environments, throughout the throughout the spectrum on different uh, you know, on different environments of the infrastructure. And that's a lot of manual work that needs to get involved into. Hence, infrastructure as code was born. Infrastructure as code was treated as the alma mater of uh, of this problem, uh, of this, uh, as alma mater solution of the problem itself. So, so, you know, a lot of companies went into infrastructure as code thinking that, hey, this is going to solve our problem and our challenges. But, Research and data say a bit of a different story. Now, this is a recent, not probably recent, like a, probably like a year old, but in 2022, Gartner actually found out by doing a survey with operational leaders that they're like 85% of the time, they're not even fully automated, right? And Gartner predicts that around 70% of the organizations to implement infrastructure automation by 2025. So, it's not really working out as everyone thought in that perspective. So the the so-called quote unquote Narvada that everyone wanted to achieve with their infrastructure being fully automated from deployment to operation to monitoring, they're not somehow for some reason they're not able to basically achieve that. It's actually not coming in. And that's where you know things don't really add up. When it, com when it comes to infrastructure as code. And rightly being said so, because when we talk about the fundamental issues with IAC, which is infrastructure as code, it gets really complex as you're scaling up. So the more resources you add in your infrastructure, the more complex it becomes. And don't even get me started when we're talking about a hybrid cloud environment. So for example, if you have some workloads on Azure and you have some workloads on, let's say, AWS or GCP, there's no way to have a unified script which can cater to both of those uh, environments using like one single command or one single CLI, right? You have to individually call those environments. And, and imagine if you want to create dependencies on, on a hybrid scale. So for example, if there's a bucket that gets deployed in Azure, but there's a VM that needs to be deployed on GCP first, and you need to create a condition where the bucket is actually dependent on the on the on the on the VM. So the bucket cannot actually be deployed before the VM actually does. This kind of doesn't is not actually possible right now. And these are some of the core fundamental issues when you're trying to scale up. Then you have to think about <coughs> naming conventions. Now naming conventions is something that uh, Usually, you know, you have to follow best practices, but, but naming conventions is a subjective matter. It changes from team to team, perspective to perspective, leaders to leaders. So you really have to look into the naming conventions and you have to basically have a sort of like a, a paradigm of what the naming conventions are going to be. Then, it come, then, then we have mis security misconfigurations. We're already having a lot of challenges with parameter securities. And now when you're doing, you know, when you're trying to deploy these resources, uh, you have to really look through the security configurations that you are going to put through when you're trying to deploy them. For example, if you're trying to deploy a bucket, you have to see whether, let's say, the version controlling on the bucket is enabled or not. So these are some of the mis security misconfigurations that could really fall in. And then state management complexities. So 
if you're trying to manually do state management, I mean that's 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 like you know hell on infrastructure land, right? Because it gets so complicated so so quickly because now you have to do state management either by storing your state files in a bucket although if you're using state files being stored on a cloud like like I'll say Terraform cloud it's awesome it's easy but that comes with a price right so but if you're trying to deploy that state file within within a bucket which is locally stored which is basically locally geospatially locally stored within your infrastructure um, that that makes it a lot complicated for you to manage and maintain and 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 especially on state locking state uh, affairs as well then we have you know then we have like challenges with complexity uh, on infrastructure hardening and then it gets very difficult to basically automate the whole deployment as you're moving along now looking at all these different challenges within infrastructure as code the solution that we as a team have come across is the Azure's cloud adoption framework. So there are around like six principles to the Azure cloud adoption framework, right? So you define your strategy, you plan your strategy, then you ready your environment, you adopt the cloud, you govern the cloud, and then eventually you manage the cloud itself. You monitor the cloud. So these are like six fundamental steps to the Azure's cloud adoption framework. And through the framework itself, you will be able to not only follow best practices, you'll also be able to be able to create a snapshot of how your infrastructure actually is going to look like. You'll be able to adopt to the upcoming infrastructure goals and challenges that are coming along the way while you're going over to Azure. You'll be able to govern compliances, security challenges, and the overall strategy and the best practices to deploy, manage, and execute within the environment. And then finally, you'll be able to manage the monitoring aspects of the infrastructure. Like for example, setting up alerts, billing alarms, doing third-party integration so that the right parties are getting notified at the right time. Um, involving key stakeholders within the process of the escalation itself, L1, L2, L3, depending on the type of challenges that you're having, you can actually cover all of those aspects using just the Azure Cloud Adoption Framework. The best part is that this framework can actually be extended using Terraform itself. Now, when you connect the Azure Cloud Adoption Framework to Terraform, you basically have this super module of Azure, which is like, maintained by not only by the community but by microsoft engineers as well it's a heavily tested module that's basically aiming to minimize your terraform code and it's in favor of data models right to deploy infrastructure though not only that it also you know heavily relies on the development of tfvars which is like the core variable files for for, for terraform and in order for you to manage your infrastructure and really helps organizations to adopt to Azure with almost no code or like very little code, you know, coding experience that you have. Combining all of these together, you create that nirvana of automation in your Azure environment itself. How does it do that? By in utilizing a, uh, a, 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 an open, a, a tool called Rover. Now, Rover is a Docker container wrapper for Terraform itself. It's an open source tool, which is again maintained by, by Microsoft engineers and the open source community. It really allows that consistent you know, development experience where you can easily push your code, you, you, know, you, 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 you create those containers, and then eventually you ship those containers to different environments as seen in the, as seen in the, in the diagram itself, right? And it also helps you manage your Terraform, you know, cloud, cloud, uh, cloud adoption frameworks orchestration and the state files and facilitates the CI CD transition as well. So basically the heavy emphasis that the SAF cloud adoption framework has on data modules over IAC, over, over, over coding is what leads to you adopting to infrastructure as data rather than infrastructure as code because the cloud adoption framework when it works right alongside with rover you 
basically are able to not only automate the deployment of your infrastructure, you're able to automate the underlying complexities that you normally would be facing when using the barebone Terraform itself. For example, the state file problem that I was earlier talking about actually can get covered within the rover aspect of things as well by, by it helping and managing that state file you know, on its own. So basically you just point it to the state file and it just keeps on maintaining and managing that state file for you. State locking as is a, is a great add-on on top of it. And it also facilitates on the CI CD transitions as well. So, so, you're, so it's very easy for you to just deploy into different environments and replicate those environments from one state to the other and do a bit of hybrid cloud within the mix as well. What are the advantages of using infrastructure as data by, by on, on, on the SAF for Terraform? Number one, low code or no code, right? So you, you don't need a lot of coding experience. Like I said, it heavily relies on the data as a, as a module, right? So it really heavily relies on that aspect. So if you're just, you know, uh, if you're just you know, utilizing those models on top of the deployment itself, uh, you, you really don't need a lot of coding experience to do that. It's a more data-driven infrastructure deployment. So using those data models, you can actually, you know, deploy your infrastructure much quicker, much faster, and, and, and understand the underlying complexities of deploying those different environments and work with them seamlessly, right? It, it's scalable without adding any complexities itself. It automatically, you know, forces you to follow best practices in respect to naming conventions. So basically, when you're working in the cloud adoption framework itself, it has its own set of naming conventions, right? So you cannot sort of like bypass that. So if if that framework forces you to use that naming convention, it's set, set across the whole organization automatically. So if anyone who doesn't follow that, it'll automatically highlight that, put it on red, and doesn't even let you deploy it, throws out an error or something. So that, you know, you need to follow this naming convention in order for you to push this code, right? follows the best practices in respect to security as well. So you have a lot of security aspects within the game. And then based on that, you know, it's easier for companies to basically follow those best practices in terms of misconfigurations and in terms of deploying those resources in a more secure manner. It's easy in hardening infrastructure. It's easy in orchestration, orchestrating state management and it's very easy to be integrated with other automation tools as well. So it truly transitions your organization into more of an infrastructure driven approach rather than an infrastructure coding approach. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is the overall understanding of what the cloud adoption framework is and what it does. Now I would like to hand it over to my colleague uh, Hamza and he's going to take you through, you know, uh, a bit of more in-depth detail on the cloud adoption framework from Azure. And along with that, he has a demo whenever he's going to go a much deeper dive into the overall framework. And then we can come back and just, you know, talk about the other, you know, the other bits of the presentation. So stay with us till the end. We have a great surprise for you. Thank you so much, Sumer. Uh, so now let's just uh, dig, uh, uh, you know, dig deep into uh, the Azure Cloud Adoption Framework. Uh, it's it's uh, practical use, it's demonstration and whatnot. So uh, before doing uh, that, th th this is crucial to understand Azure Cloud Adoption Framework hierarchical model uh, developed uh, just uh, to give the best recommendations for the Terraform deployments. Um, if you can see, the, it 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 divides into the five uh, levels, starting from from level zero uh, all the way up to the level four and if you can see uh, the level zero is where base happens and uh, uh, is where all of the levels uh, above level zero are basically standing uh, on top of level zero. So level zero is where foundation and base of your cloud adoption framework lives. For instance, the Terraform state management. And what I mean by that is basically the storage accounts and the key vaults that uh, will be used uh, to deploy the states. And then uh, there are other levels like level one, level two, level three, and level four. And level four is uh, the last level where your application workload will be living like Azure Cloud, uh, Azure, uh, Kubernetes, containers, uh, app services, SQL databases, and whatnot. The levels uh, between uh, level uh, zero and level four are basically uh, where your centralized infrastructure, where your governance and management and identity infrastructure would live. So 
the levels are not uh, uh, the levels are composed of different landing zones a landing zone is basically uh, represents or basically you can say that it is 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 basically represents or equivalent to a workspace represents a, uh, a separate terraform state file and these landing zone uh, when comes together when uh, you know march together when you know, work together uh, will basically create a level level zero may be uh, composed of a single landing zone or multiple landing zone same goes for the other levels as well uh, however the level zero uh, deployment that i will show you today uh, it will basically uh, is deployed uh, with the help of two landing zones one is basically uh, where all of the state uh, happens the storage accounts and the key vaults for the for your state files management and the other uh, landing zone will be the uh, GitOps agents where we will create a virtual machine scale set on top of the resources that we have deployed in the landing zone infrastructure so get ready for that as well so now I will talk about a little bit about my demo outline um, so let's uh, just see I will talk about I will show you uh, 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 the difference between landing zone logic and landing zone configurations I will introduce you uh, to the launch pad which I what I call uh, the basically the state management uh, which is a landing zone of the level zero I will show you the data model composition that what how we have done and how uh, cloud adoption framework uh, and the Terraform module uh, has given us and then some of the global configs and then the some of the rover commands that we have uh, we have discussed earlier uh, so before digging into uh, you know uh, actual uh, demonstration let's just uh, take a look into uh, what is actually uh, uh, the CAF super module is it, it has different names like it is called Terraform uh, cloud option framework for Terraform landing zone it can it, 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 it somewhere it called like uh, Terraform super module for Azure uh, it is maintained by uh, Azure uh, Microsoft engineers as well as open source community uh, like for example if you can see this uh, this is a github repository repository that has been linked with the uh, Terraform registry as well this mod that means this module is published in the Terraform registry as well so if you can see this is comp uh, if I can if I can go into the modules folder you can see you can you can have you can search for that and you can have all of the resources uh, if not all then more of the resources that are uh, available in the Azure in today's date and uh, if you can see uh, the last release of this module happens three weeks ago that shows uh, the uh, commitment from the open source community as well um, as well as the Microsoft engineers because this modules comes with uh, with you know a, a very uh, you know great testing uh, a very great deal of testing and you know uh, quality checks and all that and this module is not only giving us uh, uh, you know best infrastructure practices as well as the naming convention and then the, uh, the security hardening as well so if I can uh, hope into my code a little bit I can I can just uh, show you uh, what is the difference between uh, so-called Terraform logic and Terraform configurations so I have uh, multiple directories here if you can see the first one is Terraform landing zones if I can expand that this is basically where my logic lived I have just uh, told you that uh, in the level zero I will be dealing with two landing zones one is the launch pad that's basically deals with the Terraform state file management uh, with the help of rover another one would be the GitOps agents that will be creating a virtual machine scale set uh, on top of the resources that will be deployed in the launch pad so if I expand the launch pad and this is uh, the you know routine Terraform uh, TF files that you have seen already but however if you can see uh, the composite module it's it's really simple it's just uh, a, a resource that you want to deploy and it's uh, it's variable you know uh, calling its variable or uh, you know declaring its input variable and if you can see the uh, source of the module it is uh, the source if we define it like that rather than a, uh, a long URL of the github repository is the source that has been published into the Terraform registry and the version that I'm using and then uh, these are the uh, resources that I'll be deploying as part of the launch pad right so this is where uh, so there are uh, the, the recommendation is to have two different repositories or at least two different uh, directories for the logic and the configuration so to segregate between them and if you can go to the uh, 
CAF configurations, I have uh, same uh, folder structure there. Uh, it's your choice if you, if you want to have a same folder structure or not. If you go into the launch pad, you can see that it is a composition of multiple TFRs file. However, the magic comes, uh, for example, if I can see, if I can show you the key vaults or TFR, the magic comes with, uh, in those TFRs file, I'm not deploying a single resource. And I'm not deploying the only only the resource and not the other things. So what I mean by that is basically I'm deploying uh, at least five key vaults here for all of the levels uh, because uh, in the launch pad, you know, we are dealing with uh, the state management and all that. So uh, the deployment of the launch pad gives me two purposes. One, uh, to show you uh, how Terraform state management is happening. And secondly, how um, uh, the module is, is scalable and comes with the best practices and uh, uh, with, the, with the joining of the multiple things. So for example, if you can see here, I am also defining some diagnostic profiles in there. That's basically enabling the diagnostic on that resource uh, policies like uh, logged in user give me the permission of, uh, of, of of the secrets into that because I'll be adding some secrets to those you know key vaults so these are the five key vaults each represented by a, their uh, you know unique key uh, you know and uh, if you if you can if you know a little bit about a little bit about the terraform you can uh, you, you you have to know by this time that uh, you have come to know that uh, this is basically using uh, the for each loop in the back end. Uh, the power comes with when uh, we use, you know, different uh, things all together in that data model. I can also uh, define a network, you know, uh, uh, object there and, and then can define the IP rules and all that that has been already uh, been added into this module. So this is the power of this. Uh, uh, you know this module uh, other than that if I can go into the storage accounts uh, in the same way I'm creating uh, at least five storage accounts as, as part of this you know deployment and uh, I'm doing some of the some of the role mappings I'm you know creating the uh, you know diagnostic storage accounts I'll be using uh, for the diagnostics and all, each and all of those things are really the data defined this is truly moving from infrastructure as code to infrastructure as data uh, this is equally helpful uh, for the organizations who want to dip, who want to uh, you know move from infrastructure as code to infrastructure as data or the organizations want to adopt the cloud uh, maybe and for those organizations as well who are doing their deployments manually and they want to have uh, a very easy method to deploy uh, uh, the, the infrastructure into their uh, you know uh, environment uh, you know uh, scalably with the best practices and this is how Microsoft is helping us by giving us this you know super module <sighs> after these the data compositions I want to specifically talk about uh, you know uh, this global configurations right this is where uh, most of the power uh, this is where from uh, this is from where most of the power of uh, this module is uh, getting or I believe the most important part of this module is uh, lies in this uh, you know configuration file for example so if you can see on top we have a landing zone variable where we are defining uh, the landing zone information which level it is resides which backend it is using and which is the what is the key of this launch uh, of this landing zone that will be used in the upper landing zones to basically call this landing zone and get some data right and what regions are we using right uh, this would be the primary and secondary region you can uh, you can think of this like that and what would be my default region or my primary region and then there are some tags and then inherit tags just like true that means if 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 i uh, give it true that means if i am deploying uh, a tag into the resource group it will it all it will uh, you know automatically uh, inherited by the uh, components uh, or the services inside that resource group and then uh, there is also uh, I will talk about this use slug a little bit later uh, and then there's this is a prefix the prefix is just uh, a way to make your infrastructure uh, unique uh, naming convention unique so on top of uh, there are two advantages of this prefix one is basically it makes the name unique and the second is is is, is, is it's crucial for the uh, for for organizational naming convention so uh, what i mean by the making the uh, name unique is uh, because you know that most of the pass services are deployed at uh, a public endpoint and they have to have the name unique 
so this is how uh, and these things if I if, if you want to configure uh, the global things here I don't have to go to the other landing zones and define them again I can just reuse those configurations on uh, up to the level 4 uh, if I want to so uh, as of now the backend I believe uh, the supported backend is Azure RM and they are still working on uh, the support of Terraform Cloud as the backend so let's just uh, I can I want to show you another thing as well as part of the launch pad I have all I all I you know already have deployed uh, networks as well so in the networks I'm not only deploying the VNet I'm also deploying the subnets and, and on on that subnet on top of that subnet I'm also attaching it with the NSG and here I have defined the NSG so this is the power uh, uh, this is not the demonstration that I'm doing uh, is by no means exhaustive there is so much uh, in in this module just a little bit uh, glimpse for you so that you have a, 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 a little bit of idea how this uh, is helpful and how this thing uh, this module can transform your organization how this can help you in so many ways that you that we can identify uh, with this thing uh, in the same way I have also defined the TFRs files in the GitOps agents it's just uh, deploying a virtual machine scale set a uh, bunch of resource groups and then the, and the key walls however if I go into the configuration file of this you know uh, and I want to compare that with this configuration if you can see uh, I have skipped those regional things I have skipped those tags and prefixes because I am using them from uh, from from my configurations of my lower landing zone and how I'm doing that is basically using this landing zone variable uh, uh, other than those things this variable has a couple of other things as well one is the TF state basically it is referring to the launch by TF state and have, it has to uh, give you know two variables one is the what is the level if it is a below level we can uh, we can say that a level which is lower and if it is the same level we can say that the current level and we can define as as much as the tf state files uh, uh, in this and it, it must be in the manner of uh, in the hierarchical model like the upper levels can call the lower level the immediate lower level of itself and lower level cannot call the upper level and so on and so forth so this is how and, and all of those things uh, will be taken care by rover itself so now uh, so this is uh, just a little bit glimpse of this thing and if, if uh, I just want to show you another thing is basically the VMSS configurations so it's, uh, it's the data structure of my data composition of my virtual machine scale set that I'm deploying and if you can see the network interface I'm referring to uh, the VNet that I have deployed in the in the uh, landing zone uh, you know in the launch pad landing zone if I can show you uh, this is the key of my VNet and I'm using that in here if, if there would be another VNet for example uh, the key must be unique so I would be using that key and then this is a subnet that I've deployed I'm using the subnet key in here as well this is how simple this is so uh, like for example and another thing that uh, uh, I want to discuss is basically uh, the security part uh, the security you know uh, when we are talking about the infrastructure as code it is very difficult uh, to maintain uh, the security configurations alike uh, for example however uh, cloud option framework and the, this module specifically helps us to uh, you know uh, by by pr by providing us some guardrails like uh, by providing us uh, uh, some of the things that are mandatory for example uh, for the virtual machine scale set it is mandatory to define a key vault uh, before you know with the virtual machine scale sort of the virtual machine so that it can store uh, the credentials of that virtual machine or virtual machine scale sets uh, you know uh, uh, securely so I have def uh, this is the key vault key and this, this is the key vault uh, this is the key vault configuration that I've defined in here so and in anywhere in, in those configurations would not see any region that I've defined because that's the thing that already being you know defined in the global configurations <coughs> so let's let's just uh, I have uh, deployed the launch pad as well as the GitOps agents already uh, in my environment so let's just uh, take a look into them let's just uh, first analyze uh, the naming convention if I can show you uh, for example if I can show you the naming convention of the key wall for example the given name is level 0 
However, uh, what the name uh, comes, uh, the final name of the key vault is the prefix. So, and this is the resource initial. This is a u, what u slug is doing, right? Uh, which I told you I will talk about later. And this is a given name. And this goes with all of the other resources that we have deployed. So this is, this is how uh, this thing is basically um, uh, carrying out or uh, ensuring the best practices when it comes to a naming convention. And you know that uh, the people that have uh, managed infrastructure as code, uh, you know how this is very difficult in the infrastructure course to make sure the naming convention of each and every resource. So these are the resources that I've deployed as part of the launchpad, where it says launchpad. And then this is the uh, GitOps agents landing zone that I created on top of the launchpad, uh, which is using that network stuff of, of the launchpad, right? Uh, I want to show you uh, the key vault as well. If you can see the key vault and if it go into the secrets, uh, you can see that uh, there would be a couple of secrets. Just, just give it a second, <laughs> it will come. And you can see that there there are a couple of secrets. First is the private key, and the second is the public key. So this is the private key to uh, connect to the uh, virtual machine scale set, right? Uh, and this is the public key from which the private key has been, you know, derived. So yeah, uh, this is basically um, uh, this is this is basically the introduction to the data composition, data structure. I've defined uh, many things to you. I don't want to. Uh, so, so let's just uh, let's just talk about the rover itself. What is rover and how it is helping us, right? So let's just uh, make things clear. So rover is just a container uh, it developed by Microsoft engineers. It's a Terraform wrappers. It is also uh, you know uh, maintained by the open source community. It is published in the Docker registry. Um, and if you can see uh, another folder, dot dev container. This folder is used if you want to. Uh, spin up a container in the VS code. So if you have the configurations like that, if you want to uh, spin up the rover, you have to give it the configuration like that and then uh, hit on the reopen in container. So this is what I've done and I'm in my container. So if I just give it a command rover, it will show me some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, you know necessary information it will show me which user has logged in it will show me uh, what is the uh, command uh, what is the primary command to uh, deploy a landing zone right so if I can show you I have used my user in that uh, which is basically using my subscription and my tenant where I've deployed those resources so for example how you can uh, log in into rover you have to just give the command rover login and it will uh, at the back end it is using AZ login to basically log in into uh, those things and if I uh, you know uh, go with the device auth flow I can I can basically uh, you know uh, login into this rover container uh, or I can use az login command as well to basically uh, login into login into this container for example so it will take some time and it will populate all of those things in here I've used az login however it has yeah so I am uh, you know uh, right in so now let's 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 take a look into uh into the into you know so let's take a look into the rover command itself so rover command has uh, different parts first of all you have to give in uh, with the lz switch we have to give the uh, logic path with the var folder switch we have to give the tf vars file path uh, tf state uh, you know uh, you uh, it, it's for uh, the name of the TF state file what name you want to give it and then the launch pad is very specific if you want to deploy a launch pad and if launch pad is already deployed you don't need to use that switch and if you have used that mistakenly uh, no problems and then th there is another uh, environment uh, variable you have uh, environment switch uh, you have seen in in the previous uh, slides that uh, rover is being used to deploy or manage different environments so rover is it can also uh, used to deploy and many different environments. For example, if environment is dev, it's uh, it's calling the dev environment, and then if the environment is you know production, it will with the help of same commands, with the help of same you know uh, landing zone names, it can also manage the production environment with the help of this environment switch. And then there are there is a level switch which where you can uh, you have to you know tell it which level you are referring to and then there's a p switch which where we, you have to give it a plan uh, file path where you want to uh, you know save the plan file 
and then there is an action I want to run the Terraform plan. So action Terraform plan, uh, what would it would do is it would uh, it would automatically run Terraform in it and Terraform plan as a single file. And then uh, if you have uh, you know uh, given it a switch of P, it will store the Terraform plan file where you want it to store, right? And if you run the apply by giving it to the P switch of the Terraform plan file, it will run the apply by taking that plan file and if plan p switch is missing in the apply it will run the plan again and run the apply so i have taken the liberty and i have deployed deployed both of those environments uh, so i just want to show you how i've deployed the kitops agents environment so if you can see uh, this is my uh, landing zone uh, you know uh, logic directory path this is my variables directory path uh, this is uh, what my tf state would would call uh, this is my environment name uh, this is level and then this is the plan file and, and th then it runs Terraform plan so you know that we have uh, uh, we have called the TF state of the landing zone uh, launchpad landing zone and the rover with, uh, would make that happen automatically by uh, you know uh, going into the keyboard that it had deployed at his level or at its level and then use them use the storage account uh, you know get the get the state file of the launch pad and use that uh, to deploy the gate uh, gate ops agents and if you can see the telephone plan it, it it's just like the uh, simple or the uh, or the traditional telephone plan nothing fancy in here however if, uh, you know uh, before every resource or uh, you know uh, before uh, uh, before deploying a a any resource uh, there is a resource which is called Azure CAF name this is basically uh, the magic behind those uh, you know uh, those uh, exact or those best practices naming convention that it is using a resource called Azure CAF name which is basically uh, developed by Microsoft and it's been you know uh, uh, published in the terraform so it 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 first gets the name of 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 the resource and then use the result of those name into the actual resources so it's just a little bit of you know and then uh, after it generates the plan i have run the apply by using the same state uh, same plan file that i've uh, saved and if you can see it it state goes to the apply and apply those resources so uh, this was all for now and if you can uh, this is just to show you how, how much power this uh, uh, infrastructure as data has and how you can you can automate uh, so further application of this thing would be to auto you can automate that the uh, you know creation or uh, design or you know uh, data composition files with the help of ansible and other tools so thank you so much and uh, back to you sumer for that very detailed insights on uh, Azure's cloud adoption framework. Uh, hey everyone, Sumar again, and uh, thanks so much for sticking around till here to you know go through the demo and the presentation that preceded to that. Uh, now I would like to you know talk about the uh, the other part of the of the session itself, where we have an exciting offer, and it's a very exclusive offer to the folks who are very basically attending the webinar itself. So we're offering two weeks of free assessment for your Azure environment and help you understand how much of your Azure environment is automation ready. So what, I will, what we're going to do is we're going to assess the environment that you have and let you know in a very detailed SAF report that how, what are the different touch points of your Azure environment, uh, how we can help you get it automated with the best practices, how we can help you adapt to the adapt to the to the to the SAF on Azure using Terraform, so that we can help you convert your organization from infrastructure as code to infrastructure as data. Again, thank you so much for being a part of this. Again, uh, you have the email address that's written over there. That's info at royalcyberdite.com. We have the phone number as well, so you guys can you know get in touch with us to talk about the offer itself or or if, even not you can we can just you know just jump on a call have some e -co coffee <laughs> and uh, just talk about you know what are your problems and challenges and we can help you solve them uh, let's move on to questions now so please uh, feel free to ask any questions or challenges that you have the team is here to help you guys out thank you very much